Right. Our next talk is a joint work uh, between uh, Masha Polinsky and Eric Potsdam. Uh, and the title is Tongan VOS Coordination Plus Ellipsis. Um, take it away. Thank you. Can you all hear me? All right. So since we're the caboose, I'd like to take the opportunity to again thank the organizers for putting this on and showing us how to do an online conference and for setting the bar so high for future conferences. So clapping or reactions or whatever you want to do, a big round of applause for them. So thank you. All right, so this talk concerns the derivation of word order alternations in Tongan. Um, basic word order is VSO, but VOS is also allowed in many situations. It's shown in one, where you see VSO in one, A and VOS in one P. If you look over to the end of the second column in four, you can see that this alternation also occurs when the complement is a PP. It doesn't just occur when the complement is a direct object DP. All right, so assuming that VSO is the basic word order, our, our goal here is to consider how VSO would be derived. And a very quick outline of the talk, we'll first give you some morphosyntactic basics on Tongan, and then we'll consider two hypotheses for deriving VOS from VSO. One where the object displaces leftward, and a second which we will argue for, where the subject displaces rightward. Then we'll consider the a movement analysis and a complex causal coordination plus ellipsis analysis. All right, so quick basics on Tongan is a Polynesian language of the Tongic subgroup spoken by about 150,000 people, um, most in Tonga and New Zealand. So it's morphologically and syntactically ergative, it's morphologically isolating and robustly head initial. It's also at least subject pro drop. As far as our syntactic assumptions go, we assume that VSO is derived by movement of the verb to a functional head above the stick and spec T as shown in two, as been argued for by a number of people. Um, so our concern in terms of syntax is how to derive the best structure or from something very similar. And as I said, we'll investigate two analyses with global the bottom of this column, object and our subject. Under the leftward object analysis, the object is where the PP displaces leftward, and under the rightward subject analysis, the subject displaces rightward. So these two analyses are cached out on this page in section 3.1 and 3.2. So the leftward object analysis, um, following work by Otsuka and others, um, the derivation is as in five. Um, spec TP is an all purpose EPP and focus position. And there's leftward object movement of this, leftward object movement of the specifier of TP driven by the EPP and a focus feature, feature on this preposed element. Um, the subject remains a uh, little VP internal. The rightward subject displacement analysis in 3.2 is cached out as in 6. Um, the subject displaces to some right peripheral position. And for now, we'll remain agnostic on how exactly it gets there and how it's related to whatever empty category might be in the specifier of TP. So in section four, we give you three arguments in favor of the rightward subject analysis. They come from the discourse status of core arguments, um, reflexive interpretations, and word order options when a PP is present. So for as far as discourse status of core arguments goes, um, a main motivation for the leftward object displacement analysis has been the uh, claim that immediately post-verbal material is in fact, has to be focused on new information. And you can see this in the question answer pair in seven. So in answer to the object question, what did CLA leave? The felicitous word order is VOS as in 7A, left the money CLA where the post-verbal element is the new information. Uh, VSO here is in felicitous. So we'd like to propose an alternative interpretation of the data in seven namely that the right peripheral position or material is topicalized old or background information. We're not really quite sure how to talk about it at this point, so I'll be using those terms interchangeably. So object focusing, as in seven, is a side effect of the need for some constituent to be construed as new or focused information when the subject is old slash backgrounded. Um, a couple of pieces of evidence support um, our alternative interpretation. The first comes from non-focused object. The 
2004, a corpus case study of the pragmatics of word order variation showed that VOS can occur when the object is the topic of the sentence. An example from her is in nine. So in answer to the question, what happened to the fish, you can answer with the OS, stole the fish melee. So we propose that the postverbal position is actually covered by a negative condition. It's just not backgrounded. A further piece of evidence comes from indefinite subjects. Um, indefinite subjects are possible in VSO, but not VOS. So 10A is VSO, um, kicked a child the cat, which is grammatical, but 10B, the VOS, um, kick the cat a child is not grammatical. So under our story, indefinites resist topic interpretation and so they can't be the subjects in VOS. Something similar shows up with WH phrases. Um, Tongan allows WH and C2, but subject WH and C2 is only allowed with VSO and not VOS. So VSO is possible in 12A. Um, This model proposal of WAs cannot be topic inherently focused. So skipping the next subsection to summarize this argument, subjects in VOS we claim are topical or backgrounded or old information. Um, this isn't accounted for under the leftward object movement analysis since the subject has the same morphosyntax in both VSO and VOS. Under the rightward subject analysis, the subject, the status of the subject in VOS can be attributed to its unique rightward structural position, whatever that turns out to be. The second argument comes from reflexive interpretations. Um, Tongan doesn't have a dedicated anaphor, um, instead a reflexive is immediately post-verbal or following the lower argument. So some examples are given in 14a and b. 14a, Pila takes care of himself at the hospital. Um, the emphatic particle there, pay, is parenthesized and it can occur either after the verb care or after the lower um, object argument, him. Uh, in 14b, Pila helps himself. Here, the verb has an absolute of dative case frame. And again, the uh, reflexive reading is, is allowed if pay is either right after the verb help or right after the lower dative argument. Um, 15 just shows that if pay occurs after the binder or the higher argument, then you don't Pila with the attempted meeting. Pila takes care of himself. So our assumptions about reflexive are fairly conservative here in 16. We assume that subjects or whatever is in spec TP is structurally superior to complements. And we'll simply stipulate that reflexive interpretation is possible when this emphatic particle follows the verb or the structurally lower slash bound argument. All right, so looking at VOS, the two analyses make different predictions about reflexive binding. Under the rightward subject analysis in VOS, the structural relationships between the object and the subject are the same as in VSO, and you can see that if you turn back to the earlier tree. So we expect the same reflexive options in VOS as in VSO. And in our data, this is the case, so the VOS examples are given in 17A and B. 17A has the emphatic particle immediately after the verb care, um, 17B has the impact particle after the uh, lower object argument, the absolute. Um, so there's variation in the judgments on, the, on these senses, as I indicate, which weakens the argument. Um, but turning to the leftward object analysis, um, in VOS, the object A moves across the subject in spec TP. So 17B, in fact, is predicted to be ungrammatical as a principal C violation, because the pronoun C commands the co-indexed noun uh, our expression pila. Instead we predict the object to be able to bind the subject as a movement creates new binding. Your math for the absolute then is the full noun phrase and the ergative is the pronoun. Um, but this is ungrammatical. So Otsuka 2005c has an explanation for this stipulating that the antecedent of a flexibly interpreted pronoun must be ergative in order to prohibit 18. Um, but this would incorrectly exclude 14b, which had uh, reflexive binding with an absolute of dative case frame. So we conclude that reflexive patterns are identical in VSO and VOS, at least for our consultants, which would support the rightward subject analysis. And the last argument comes from word order when a PP is present. Um, in that case, the word order is VSOPP, or what I'll call VSOX. 
So in 19, left Sione, the book, in the room. So when these three dependents are present, other word orders are possibly shown in 20a. You can also have VOSX or VOXS. The other orders in 20b are disallowed. So we claim that the rightward subject analysis does a superior job in accounting for these orders. Um, looking at the leftward object analysis first, it both overgenerates and undergenerates these uh, the possible word orders. Um, it does correctly pre predict that an alternative word order will be VOSX, um, but it undergenerates VOXS and it overgenerates VXSO. So these three claims are illustrated in 21 through 23. In 21, we see that it correctly generates VOSX. The object simply moves across the subject to step TP. It undergenerates VOXS, shown in 22. The derivation would, be have to, would have to be as shown where both the object and the prepositional phrase move to spec TP, but we'll assume here that there's only one spec TP that would be available. And then finally, it overgenerates the word order VXSO. Um, here, the prepositional phrase is shown in 23 to have moved to spec TP, but the sentence is in fact ungrammatical. Rightward subject analysis on the next page um, does somewhat better. Um, it correctly predicts that an alternative word order will be VOXS. Um, it does, doesn't overgenerate, but it undergenerates VOSX. So the, gener the derivation of VOXS is shown in 24. The subject in VSOX simply moves to the end. Um, it undergenerates the grammatical example in 25, VOSX, where the subject is rightward, but not absolute rightward. It occurs before the prepositional phrase. Um, we can account for this by assuming that some PPs can be highly joined on the right, namely outside of the rightward subject, wherever it is. Um, so to summarize, we believe that VOS results from rightward displacement of the subject rather than leftward displacement of the object. From a cross-linguistic perspective, object shift for focus purposes would be slightly unusual, although not unheard of. Um, so given this conclusion, I'll turn it over to my co-presenter who will talk about how the subject might get on the right. So there are two ways to get the subject on the right. Um, one is uh, just by moving it's uh, using rightward movement. And the other is a more complicated analysis, which also has some movement components, but also involves um, coordination of clauses and ellipses. So the rightward movement analysis is shown in 26, where the empty category is a copy of the subject and the subject itself goes to the right in the specifier of XP2 as shown in 26. This is very similar to what we find in head final languages where it's typically called rightward scrambling. And this is where rightward movement has always held its place. But more recently, people have proposed similar rightward topicalization for head initial languages, in particular, Clemens and Kuhn um, entertain this possibility for mine. So it's pretty common. Uh, the coordination and ellipsis analysis is something that makes um, Austronesian look like Germanic, a very common move in uh, linguistic theory and analysis of Austronesian. The idea being that VOS results from coordination of two clauses, where the second clause specifies the first one, similar to what Ott and de Vries proposed for Germanic. And it's the second clause that contains the right word subject, the subject undergoes some movement, which I will discuss in a moment, and then the rest of the clause is elided. There is no movement relationship between the subject in the first clause and the subject in the second clause. They're just linked categorically. So for the familiar example in 27, this is shown in 27B. So you have something like he left the money, Siale, and then we elide left the money. So let's, um, 28 shows the schematics of this analysis. And the crucial thing here is that the two clauses are connected by um, a specifying coordinator, uh, where the uh, idea is that for all the individuals and events in the first conjunct, the specification of operator presupposes that they're identical to some individual event and so on in the other conjunct. Um, this is not um, impossible, and in fact, Tongan allows juxtaposed sentences with ne near identity, although consultants find them pragmatically odd because of redundancy, but you get cases like 29, someone called the teacher, Sione called them. 
So we have two ways to get the subject to the right, and both of them have their advantages and also some flaws. So I'm going to discuss some of those, um, trying to uh, decide between these two analyses. Uh, there are some considerations which are more theory internal, and then uh, looking at the table on six, um, if you look at the lower portion of the table under the thick line, these are some empirical considerations driven by Tongan facts. So the first one, um, the first set of considerations, which are more theory internal, have to do with information's role of the subject, um, the placement of rightward movement in linguistic theory, and the motivation for movement more generally. So in uh, the movement analysis, we have to posit a feature, topic, or background. Eric already mentioned that it's not quite clear what this feature is, but this is what people have done for rightward movement in head final languages, like in Manet's work. Um, this is not really explanatory. It gives um, no expectations about the information structure of the final subject. You just stipulate it by brute force. The ellipsis analysis does better here because the final subject basically specifies something that is its correlate in the first clause. And one of the crucial constraints under specifying coordination is that the element in the second clause, which specifies an element in the first clause, cannot introduce a new discourse reference. It must be descriptively richer than its correlate. So in terms of the information structure of the subject, information structure role of the subject, the mm, ellipsis analysis does better. Then there is this whole issue of what rightward movement has to do in linguistic theory. Um, a lot of people <clears throat> who um, adopt some kind of anti-symmetry approach are very uncomfortable with rightward movement. On the other hand, there are quite a few analyses which allow rightward movement and Oberfeld's dissertation makes a compelling case for rightward movement as driven by economic consideration. So this is an open question. And then finally, Related to that is how we motivate the movement. So, um, as I already mentioned, the rightward movement is not well motivated. In the ellipsis analysis, we somehow have to get the uh, fragment in the second clause to the left before we light the rest of the material. And Tongan has two ways of doing that. One is uh, so called co topicalization or focusing, a very common operation in Polynesian languages where some element gets to the front and is marked by the particle co. And the second is fragment answers. The way of co topicalization, you get examples similar to 32A and B, uh, co mele stole the fish, or co pita went to New Zealand. Uh, but for our purposes, co topicalization or focusing is not the right structure for the ellipsis because co does not appear on the right word subject as you can see in uh, 34b. And the other fact is that um, anything that follows code does not bear any case marking, whereas in our structure, the case marking is retained as shown in 35. Uh, so it looks like we had to go to another derivation that is fragment answers, where uh, we have something like the English example in 36, where you front the answer to a high left peripheral position and then elide the rest. So who's laughing? Mary, and then you like Mary's laughing. Tongan, Tongan has fragment answers, and in fact, they do not require co, and they allow um, case preservation. So you have something like 37, who is laughing, you have to keep the absolute of the child or he, she, um, who will do the work, you have to keep the ergative. So mechanically, this gives us the right result, but the problem is that fragments are new information or are in focus, whereas our rightward subjects are old or background information. So this is where, again, we face a little bit of a dilemma. Now, uh, another problem that arises has to do with subject politic doubling. In VSO, subject politics can co-occur with a null pronominal, but not with a full noun phrase. That's a well-attested fact about Tongan. So you get 39, he ate the fish with a politic ne, but Sione ate the fish in 39b is bad and clearly cannot be doubled. Uh, likewise, in 40, for, for an intransitive clause. We find that subject clitic is impossible in VOS or VXS, which is unexpected under the ellipsis analysis. Under a movement analysis, whatever causes clitic doubling in VSO will be, bad, will be the same mm, cause as in VOS. 
So the moment analysis does well here. Now, ellipsis does not explain why subject plane doubling is impossible because the first clause is presumably independently well formed and has a null phenomenal. And so the clitic should be possible. Uh, there may be some non syntactic explanations for this, in which case the ellipsis analysis can still be rescued. Uh, another consideration which actually argues in favor of the ellipsis analysis is episode doubling. So ellipsis predicts that the right wing subject can be doubled in the first clause under the movement analysis that doubling should be impossible. And in fact, most speakers we consulted do allow the episodes um, in the post-verbal subject position like in 43b. So you have something like went uh, the idiot to the principal PILA. Um, uh, for the movement analysis to be successful, we'll have to really reconsider uh, what episodes are, and as long as there is a possibility that they're not pronouns, maybe the movement analysis can be rescued. I already showed you some case connectivity facts, so I'm not going to go over them, but basically both analyses fare really well with case connectivity. So as an intermediate summary, we see that the movement and the ellipsis analysis are both successful. However, each of them faces a couple of theoretical and empirical challenges. And to conclude, we've shown that um, the derivational relationship between VSO and VOS and Pongan is better captured by moving the subject to the right or positioning the subject to the right rather than the leftward displacement. And a similar proposal in terms of the rightward positioning has been made for Greek. We've shown you some arguments in favor of the rightward positioning of subjects, such as the discord status of core argument, the reflexive interpretation, case connectivity, and word order options within agile. And then we've presented this dilemma that we're facing, where we have two analyses, each of which is fairly successful, but not completely flawless in terms of, of getting the subject to the right. So both analysis work and an outstanding question, question that we'd love to hear input on is how to adjudicate between the two approaches. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we have around eight minutes for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please indicate so in the chat. All right, uh, Lauren? Please unmute yourself. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so my question is, has to do with the first part of the presentation. Um, and if you guys have considered the possibility that, you know, given some of the, I don't know, I guess equivocal data arguing against um, the A bar, if the arguing against A, a scrambling, if it were possible, one possible explanation would be that there are two different VOS constructions. Um, so, you know, you've made fabulous arguments for the existence of the right side topic, but is there a possibility in your view that there may be more than one way to derive VOS? Um, it's possible. Uh, we've tried to look at some other arguments and um, it looked like uh, one of the possibilities that you guys use is to, to use prosody and the prosodic arguments are not very conclusive. So I don't think we can completely rule it out, but based on um, all the other primary data, I don't think we have found any, um, any indication that um, there are two ways to get the OS. What we'll see is that the subject on the right will always be, you know, definite specific background. And so then the question is, do you move it or do you just specify? Then we're back to our two analyses. Right, so the, the other consideration is, is if there is a second analysis, it, analysis mm -hmm. it has to be subject to the same kind of restrictions on that subject. Right. So it can also capture the subject restrictions and we'd be better off with just one, if they both do the work. We have a question from Josina. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a comment and a question. So the comment is um, 
if it's possible in common to have n um, quantified MPs like at most or few, um, Cornelia Eber has shown that these quantifiers can't be topicalized. So you were forget uh, you would um, predict that in VOS order you can't say something like at most ten students uh, brought a book something like that. Um, it would only be possible in um, VSO word order. Um, um, yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. So, um, so I, I mean, it's only possible if you can have quantified NPs like that in the language to do that kind of test. Um, and then the, the short question I had was, if you've thought about if fragment answers from in polar questions might help you tease apart the ellipsis versus movement. Um, but then uh, if you're, uh, yeah, I was just trying to think about uh, as during your presentation, how that might help, but um, I'm not sure if it's uh, gonna help because of the word order like, can you answer um, a polar question uh, with just the verb, like, or with just an auxiliary, like, uh, can um, Siale swim? Can you just say can as a yet affirmative answer? Um, but that's not a polar question. Am I? Uh, Oh, oh uh, sorry. Um, I yeah, thought you meant yeah, alternative. Yeah, I, I thought you meant alternative question. Yeah, you can do that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that it has been used to show that um, Tongan has verb raising. Um, I think with uh, back to your point of sorry, Masha. Pro drop. Go ahead. It has subject pro drop, so that's another problem. Okay. Uh, back to your quantifier. Um, question. Uh, it's a little more complicated. So I think with at most, a lot of these quantifier uh, elements, they look like adverbs. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to test. But um, one of the most common ones is katoa, um, all which has been analyzed for, as an adverb by quite a few researchers. Um, and so we do find that um, there is a preference to have it right after the verb, but um, we do not find it in VOS position. So, but again, okay. I would be, I wouldn't really pin all my hopes to this one because this is um, the, the status of what we call quantifiers or we think are quantifiers is not entirely clear, but at least it goes in the right direction. Right. Yeah, but I'm afraid right. that the polar okay. questions won't really help much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, we have a question from Yuko. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, can you hear me? Hi, Yuko. Thanks, Masha and Eric. This is very Hi. interesting. Um, and uh, I have one data question and then a comment, probably. So uh, that uh the examples 37 and 38 so that's the um fragment right mm -hmm. and so and so is this this is elicitation right yes yes and then so you asked um kohai okata and then ask the informant to give me non-full sentence answer or something like that? Uh, no, we just collect this. Uh, no, what we did was we, we asked them how to answer this question. We didn't tell them how. And you, of, co you, of course, you can also answer with ko. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible. So this is not the only one, but the crucial fact for us is that um, it's possible. 37A and 37, 38A are possible, and then you cannot drop the case marker. Right, okay. So yeah, so for, for me, the most natural answer would be call. 
Yeah, yeah, they also call like or something. But they don't you, reject this one. Right, so but if you ask like, okukata, ahai, so, you know, mm -hmm. or um, in situ WH, they would definitely say, a somebody or a somebody they wouldn't use uh -huh. so right. you know so that is really like the copy and delete type of um, mm -hmm. okay. thing so what with this 37 38 is a bit surprising to me but um mm -hmm. and then so this uh coordination analysis is sort of like it's a, a afterthought mm -hmm. um you know so go ate it uh, John or something like that right right, right. and so that's, that's and then this movement to the higher position is it a spec C I can I don't quite remember but in the second uh, conjunct you need to move that thing to the higher position spec CP yes mm -hmm. let me get the structure here we go in here yeah, shown as thank you. right and then so this is um i'm sorry i probably missed this this is like a topicalization what is yes. the nature of this movement and and i also i'm kind of curious how you can manage to keep um ergative case marking or affective case well yeah ergative case marking in this position because as you have shown that uh that kind of topicalization is not possible elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's exactly but the my problem curiosity. for us. Well, yeah. it's our curiosity too, because we don't, um, <laughs> that's where we entertained either core or the fragment answer. And the core thing doesn't get you the case connectivity. The fragment answer uh, violates syntactic ergativity that we see elsewhere, except in fragment answers. And if we follow the fragment answer route, then we get the wrong information structure. Uh, but the, the general inspiration for this more complex analysis comes from the analysis of afterthought in Germanic languages that mm -hmm. we follow Otto de Vries. But yeah. you're, you're exactly right. This is where the main problem lies. Eric, do you want to add anything? <laughs> no, I agree. That's, that's the main point. You just reiterated it. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. I mean, it, I, I find it really interesting. It's good to have yeah, multiple it's analysis, it's right, Lawrence? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yoko. All right.